So the first important thing we need to remember in order to be successful learners of real analysis is how to attend to logical statements and how to structure proofs of those logical statements. In particular, the kinds of statements that we care most about are the statements that have the form of an implication. If P, then Q. A lot of important results and theorems and propositions in real analysis have that form. If something is true, then this other thing is guaranteed to be true. Um, so how to understand those statements, how to build them out of their component pieces, how to negate them to turn them on their heads to make them false when they were true previously or vice versa, and then most importantly, how to structure a, uh, an effective proof of those statements is what we care about the most uh, in today's session. So let's start from the beginning. Um, mathematics in general, most mathematical disciplines, especially in pure math, um, deal in what's called propositional logic. And a logical proposition can't just be any statement that we pull, uh, you know, sort of out of thin air. A logical proposition, we agree to be something which is a decidable claim. It's a statement which either is definitely true or it's definitely false. Now, just because we don't know which one it is doesn't preclude a statement from being a logical proposition. I'm thinking of um, you know, something like the Riemann hypothesis or one of these famous unsolved questions in mathematics is still a logical proposition, even though we don't have a proof or a disproof of it yet, so we don't know whether it is true or it is false. But it is a statement which can either be true or it can be false. It cannot be both true and false somehow, and it cannot fail to be either true or false. Right? It's definitely one or the other. And what's great about that is that logical propositions satisfy what we call the law of the excluded middle. The law of excluded middle says that when we have something which is either true or it's false, that there is no third path. There is no in-between. So any statement which is true is not false. And conversely, any statement which is not true is definitely false. Why this is important is it actually gives us an avenue for how to prove a logical proposition later on. Sometimes it's instead of proving directly that a statement is true, we can instead show that it's not false. And if I've shown that it's not false, that then guarantees that it's true. So this is why we like logical propositions, is that they really are, they have this sort of black and white quality. They're either, definitely, they're either all the way true or they're all the way false. There's no in between and there's no none of the above. And so once I have a logical proposition, so let me just pick an example of a logical proposition. Maybe, well, let's, let's put sort of three of them up here on the board. Let's consider the statement P, which is six is a prime number. That's a logical proposition because either that statement is definitely true or it's definitely false, that there's no in between. It's not kinda true and it can't be none of the above, right? Same thing with the statement dolphins are mammals, which we're calling Q, and the statement the moon is made of cheese, we we'll call that R. So here are three examples of logical propositions. Now you might already be thinking as a math major, well, these aren't all true. No, they're not all true, in fact, right? Um, but that doesn't preclude them from being propositions, right? Proposition can be a false statement, but it has to be a statement that is definitely one or the other. Once we understand what propositions are, we can also stick them together to make more complex propositions. And we use there what are called logical connective operators. They're like the operators of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division when we're working with numbers, right? They're just ways of making new propositions out of old ones. And so here are the four that we care the most about in classical propositional logic. Um, the first one is called the logical disjunction, which we usually think of by the simple word or. So P or Q. So we would say in vernacular, the new logical proposition would be six is a prime number or dolphins are mammals. So that whole long sentence now becomes a single proposition that we call P or Q. In notation, we use this little V, V looking symbol uh, to stand in for a logical or. And the logical or, the disjunction, is a true statement. So that whole sentence, six is prime or dolphins are mammals, that whole sentence is true when either one or the other or both of the original statements are themselves true. So the, the disjunction, the logical or, is not fussy, it's not particular. As soon as even one of its component pieces is true, that makes the whole disjunctive statement true. So in the example, six is a prime number or dolphins are mammals. Well, the statement six is a prime number, I think we can agree as mathematicians, is not true. But the statement dolphins are mammals, we can ask, you know, Wikipedia, Alexa, are dolphins mammals? Yes. Oceanic dolphins, or delphinidae, are a widely distributed family of dolphins that live in the sea. Thirty extant species are described. 
They include several big species. Alexa, that's enough. Thank you. So we can conclude that dolphins are, in fact, mammals. Um, we can say that that's a true statement. And so if I were to form the compound statement P or Q, six is prime or dolphins are mammals, the fact that dolphins are mammals is a true statement is sufficient to make the entire statement P or Q a true statement. As soon as one of the pieces is true, the whole disjunction becomes true. And so that stands in contrast to the second one of our connectives, the and connective. We call it the logical conjunction. And instead of a, a V symbol, we use an upside down V looking symbol uh, to, to, to denote the and, the logical and. And a conjunctive statement, an and statement, is true only when all of its pieces are true. So in order for P and Q to hold, we need P and Q to both be true. And so in our example here, six is a prime number and dolphins are mammals. Well, one of these statements is true, but the other one is false. And so as soon as one of the individual pieces is false, that makes the whole statement false. So the and statement here is false, because in order for it to be true, we would have needed both of the pieces to have been true. So that's the big difference between an and and an or. When we go forward into the next session and talk about sets, you'll notice that this or and this and are exactly the logical operators on which the operations of union and intersection of sets are built. And so it's not an accident that the or symbol in logic looks kind of like the union symbol for sets and that the and symbol in logic looks kind of like the intersection symbol for sets. Uh, so hang on to that nugget for when you look at sets in our next session. The logical negation, not, is something we think a lot about. Um, and the negation does exactly what you would expect it to do. That the negation of a statement is true exactly when the original statement is false and vice versa. So it takes the, the truth value of that statement and, and totally turns it inside out. There's a couple different notations that get used for it. Um, I like to use this little sideways looking L, um, but sometimes you see it written as a little twiddle like this one. Um, and so a not statement is true exactly when its, uh, when its component statement is false. So six as a prime number is a false statement. But the negation of that statement, which we would write six is not a prime number, uh, that that statement would then be true because the original statement was false. Finally, and this is probably the star of the show, right? The star of the show is the conditional statement. If P, then Q. Again, because so many theorems and results that you'll have to contend with in real analysis are built out of these uh, implications. And so we write P, right arrow Q. Sometimes we say P implies Q. Or if you like, P is sufficient for Q. There's a lot of different language that we can use to convey this idea. Um, and the truth value of a, a conditional statement, a conditional statement, if P then Q, says that whenever P is a true statement, we know that for sure Q will also be a true statement, right? Um, so if I'm, if I'm stuck in the rain, then I have an umbrella, right? So let's suppose that that implication is true. Um, then that means that any time that I'm stuck in the rain, then I must have an umbrella. Whenever P is Q, true, sorry, Q must be true as well. But the other wrinkle in that is that an implication statement doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't guarantee us anything about what happens when the premise, the P, is false. So the statement, if it's raining, then I have my umbrella, doesn't tell me anything about what happens when it's not raining. If it's not raining, maybe I have my umbrella, maybe I don't. Yeah. We can't say for sure whether that implication is true or false when the premise is false. And so what we have to do is ask, as we're going to do in a few minutes when we start talking about negations, what would be necessary in order to prove this statement to be false? When is the statement false? Well, the only way that I can prove that it's false, that if it's raining, then I have an umbrella, is to find an example in which it was raining, so P was true, but I didn't have my umbrella. Q was false. Um, and in every other case, we have not proven that implication to be false. And so an implication is also true any time that its premise is false. We call that a vacuously true implication. So if it's not raining, we're going to say that that you know, doesn't falsify my claim, and so it must show that this is true. So an implication is true when either its premise is false or when both its premise and its conclusion are true. Uh, and so it's part, partly because of that intricacy uh, that uh, proving implications, proving a P implies Q kind of statement, um, is both kind of 
tricky to do, but it also we have a lot of different ways that we can approach doing it, which is what we're ultimately going to talk about today. So with all of this, what I'd like for you to do is to take a few minutes and take these three statements. The statement P, which is that 6 is a prime number, which we're going to agree is false. The statement Q, dolphins are mammals, which we're going to agree is true. And the statement R, the moon is made of cheese, which I think we can also agree is false. And I'd like for you in your small groups to spend five minutes or so coming up with four examples of true compound statements that are built out of those pieces, those P's, Q's, and R's. Uh, we'll write them up and we'll talk about why it is that they're true.